All right, Judge, I feel so fortunate to be able to have you on the show today. I'm, I'm going to be right up front with you. It took me about five months to track down people who knew people who knew people who knew you. So I appreciate you taking time out of your day to come on and talk about some truly important topics for our country, um, for Americans, and for the world. Um, you have a podcast and a show right here on YouTube, Judging Freedom, and we're going to make sure to put a link up for that. But I want to jump in. You are known for your mind when it comes to the U.S. Constitution, um, also with what's going on with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And so one, one thing that uh, I was asked to ask you is it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, corruption, special interest groups, uh, money leaking into politicians' pockets has infiltrated the, the government. What is the best way for us to root out this evil or is voting good people in and bad people out the only way that we're going to save the country? Well, Stephen, it's a pleasure to be with you. And of course, it turned out we have a close mutual friend. So after you went through five degrees of separation, you found someone who's a friend of each of us and hence we're here and hopefully uh, this won't be the last time uh, we do it. I'm thrilled uh, to be on with you. you. You do great work. You have a, a huge audience. I'm happy for your audience to hear uh, hear my thoughts and, and learn of my program. Uh, Jefferson argued that the uh, Constitution, and that would mean federal laws, uh, should all expire once in every generation, and we should have to, uh, in the case of the Constitution, re-ratify it or change it radically and ratify a new one. And in the, in the case of federal laws, uh, reenact them, particularly those uh, that give away property from others. Um, the Constitution, which was written to establish the federal government, was also written to restrain it. It has been a dismal, mon monumental failure uh, at restraining the federal government. So when you talk about electing good people to office, to me, good people would mean Ron Paul or Thomas Massey, people who really believe that the individual is sovereign, that the government works for us, uh, that the government's only duty is to protect our natural rights, not to take property from those who work and have it and give it to those uh, who don't. So, uh, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin also said, when the people learn they can vote themselves money from the government, that's the end of democracy. And Jefferson, again, along with Alexander Hamilton, they never agreed on anything, but they agreed on this. When the people learn that the public treasury is a public trough, they will only send to Washington those who will give away the, the most money. All those things are true. Uh, so I'm not sure that electing good people is the answer. Uh, it depends, of course, on how you define good. There are good Republicans and good Democrats. There are good liberals and good conservatives. There are some good progressives and good libertarians, but good is not enough. Faithful to the first principles of the non-aggression principle, the primacy uh, of the individual, uh, the belief that government is, ser is the servant and not the master, the belief that our rights come from our humanity. Uh, be difficult to find a majority of people that uh, accept those views. So the answer is probably some uh, change of government with uh, serious restraints on the federal government, perhaps like those, I know I'm getting down to other things you wanted to ask, if you don't mind, perhaps like those which Madison, who wrote the Constitution, and Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration, intended, which would mean nullification and secession. So if, uh, if a state legislature or the highest court of a state believed that um, an act of the Congress was unconstitutional, the state could nullify it in that state. That's what happened with the Alien and Sedition Acts in Kentucky and Virginia. Those resolutions were written secretly by Madison and uh, by Jefferson. Or a state which voluntarily joined the union, and they all did, though some had guns to their heads, uh, could voluntarily leave. Uh, those are the only types of uh, checks and balances that work uh, to, to a big government Republican or a big government Democrat. 
the thought that the tax base would shrink or the area, the geographic area over which they have authority to regulate and dominate would shrink is about the only thing uh, that I can think of that would restrain them. Now, if by an act of God and a legion of angels, more than half the Congress were to be filled with people like Thomas Massey or Ron Paul, and someone with that mindset were to be in the White House and appointing members of the federal judiciary, that obviously would have the same effect, but it wouldn't happen overnight. Okay. Yeah, that because I, you know I see people you know in my community they say all the time we need these term limits we need to uh, you know gut the deep state or we need to drain the swamp or we you know each side has their own little idiom for cleaning up Washington D.C. Uh, but as I see it, why on earth would politicians change the rules that would get them voted out when they can make a career? of siphoning money off the American people and from special interest groups by becoming a career politician. Well, they won't. You're exactly right. You know, um, term limits for the Congress would require an amendment to the Constitution, which means two thirds of each House of Congress adopting an amendment and then sending it around to the states and three quarters of the states um, ratifying it. Now that happened 27 times but it's, it's hardly likely to happen. The only way it might happen is, is if it happened in futuro, meaning if it did not affect those in office at the time, it would take a while for it to kick in, but that's about the only way I could think of it happening. There is of course an alternate way to amend the constitution, which has never been done. And that is a convention of the states. Believe it or not, there's 27 or 28 states that have asked for a convention They've asked for it on the balanced budget issue, but of course a convention, if it were to occur, it would require 37 states, so another 10 wouldn't be limited. It could send anything it wanted, either amendments or an entirely new constitution uh, to the state legislatures. The constitution itself theoretically uh, was not intended. The constitutional convention theoretically was called to propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation. You know, James Madison had a number of careers, but in his big government days, which followed his career uh, as a revolutionary and preceded his career as a small government member of the House who wrote the Bill of Rights, uh, secretly had a draft of the Constitution in his pocket when they arrived in Philadelphia and persuaded the delegates to exclude the press close the shutters on the windows, and even though it was the summertime without electricity, to stay in, in locked rooms for three months until they came up with a document that everybody expected would be amendments to the Articles of Confederation. Instead, it was, instead it was a new uh, government with uh, tremendous central controls, particularly on the uh, economy. Um, so all hope is not lost, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, uh, I got to listen to Ron Paul uh, just over the internet with the Rage Against the War Machine. I also put out a video from Tulsi Gabbard talking about how these uh, war-loving Democrats and war-loving Republicans are, are pushing us to uh, a, a conflict we may not be able to back ourselves out of. Um, and his words were, were, were very inspiring, as well as uh, our friend Gerald Salente, uh, you know, letting people vote uh, whether we go to war or not, not Biden blowing up, uh, you know, uh, natural gas pipelines and, and doing things behind Congress's back. But um, go, going back to the, the, the federal government, just because you, you are so well versed in this, was the federal government ever supposed to become the largest employer on planet Earth? Yeah. And on I, top I, of that, like all, all the taxes, like, they it was supposed to be maybe like no tax and then like a two percent tax then a nine percent and now it, it's just ballooned out of control to the point where people are like of course they have to tax us to death how do you run a country i can't imagine that even alexander hamilton uh, who was the father of big government who wanted george washington to be a king um and of course is the father of the first national bank of the united states which in after several iterations becomes the Federal Reserve, 
I can't imagine that even he uh, expected the federal government would be the largest employer in the United States and, as you say, uh, on the planet. And the, the document, the Constitution itself, prohibits the federal government from taxing individuals. Woodrow Wilson, I think, arguably one of the worst presidents, the worst after Lincoln um, in history, uh, persuaded the country that the federal income tax would never exceed never exceed three percent of adjusted gross. Well, we know where it is now, um, and persuaded the Congress and state legislatures to allow the federal government to reach into uh, people's incomes. In a bit of delicious irony, it was the so-called libertarian. If you're an Austrian side of economics, as I am, you don't consider him a libertarian. But if you're plain vanilla, uh, you do consider Milton Friedman a libertarian, was a, a young, he hadn't even gotten his PhD from Rutgers yet, clerk in the Treasury Department during World War II came up with the idea of withholding, withholding taxes. So the federal government gets your money at the same time you do and decide how much uh, it keeps. Uh, these two were enormous leaps toward uh, where we are uh, today where most people work from January to June uh, just for uh, the federal government. Congress does not believe in staying within the confines of the Constitution domestically or in foreign affairs, domestically in areas where it can't regulate. Examples, these are examples that affect everyday lives. Congress wanted to lower the speed limits. Congress wanted to lower the blood alcohol content in your veins before an arrest for DWI would be triggered. Even Congress recognized there's no basis for them to regulate this under the Constitution. So what they do, they bribe the states. They said to every state in the union, we will repave at our expense all the federal highways in, in every state if the state will lower its speed limit and lower the uh, maximum uh, blood or uh, the minimum blood alcohol content before an arrest for DWI is triggered. South Dakota said, forget about it. We'll take the cash. We're not going to lower it. We don't even have speed limits here. Uh, the Supreme Court um, said to South Dakota in a, in a six to three uh, ruling, uh, you want the cash, you take the strings. Now, what big government pink left-wing pinko creep signed that into law? Ronald Reagan. <laughs> So, I mean, these things happen uh, across the board yeah. with respect to big government uh, extension of congressional authority outside, I'm giving you a horrible but true example, outside the confines uh, of, the, uh, of the Constitution. The same thing happens with respect to war. Congress has not declared war. There is no legal, moral, military, or constitutional basis for Congress to declare war on Russia, none. But because the Supreme Court has said Congress can spend its money however it wants, it gave Joe Biden a blank check for $100 billion and said, said spend that however you want. When Thomas Massey in the House and Ron Paul in the Senate offered legislation to have an inspector general assure that the money went to the right people in Ukraine, Congress uh, didn't even take a vote on that. Even when George W. Bush wasted two trillion on a, the, the criminal wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, there were expect, inspector generals certifying where the money went. How do we know that? One of them just reminded us the other day that he couldn't find a hundred million in cash, literally cash that came over on pallets in C-10 uh, cargo planes directly from the treasury uh, to Iraq. Nobody knows where it went. It escaped the uh, clutches of the inspector general. So we don't know where all this cash and even where a lot of the equipment's going in Ukraine. We do know that when uh, the Ukraine military uh, has caused Russians to drop their equipment and flee, ready for this? Some of the equipment they dropped was made in the United States. How did they get it? They either got it from us sending it to the wrong people or they captured it from the Ukraines and they knew how to use it. They were using it back uh, against the Ukraines. 
Did Congress declare war? No. Did Congress authorize boots on the ground? No. Do we have troops there? Yes, we do, but they're out of uniform, which allows old Joe to say we don't have boots on the ground. Are we shooting at Russians? We are. We have military in Poland picking targets in Russia, operating American military equipment in Ukraine and pulling the trigger in Poland. The people pulling the trigger have a uniform on, United States Army. The, the people finding the targets do not have a uniform on, but the US Army finding the targets. That's American boys killing Russian boys. What's the definition of that? War. Yeah. So, so it's like a semantics game where it's like, oh, well, you know, as long as he wasn't in uniform, he's acting on his own or, or under the Polish government or, or something like that. But th those of us with our eyes open can see that th this is really a war between NATO and, and Putin and Ukraine just happens to be in the middle. Yes, it's getting, I think, personalized between uh, Joe Biden and Putin. And I got to tell you, I have nothing against Joe Biden. I happen to know him personally and I like him, but the Joe Biden that I know and like is from about 20 years ago. That was the Irish Catholic, beer drinking, mass attending, pro-life, Scoop Jackson, JFK, middle of the road, moderate, constitution respecting Joe Biden. Now he's been tugged so far to the left, he's barely uh, recognizable. We actually sat with each other I'm not sure where you are, but in the East Coast of the United States, we have a high-speed train called the Acela, which goes from Boston to New York, New York to DC. Joe Biden took that train every day, the, the last leg of it from Wilmington to DC. I took it from New York to DC a couple of times a month when uh, my former employer, Fox, sent me to DC. And invariably, I ended up on the train with him. And when I did, uh, we sat next to each other. We also taught together at Delaware Law School. I was full-time, he was an adjunct. Uh, this is in the Reagan years, so back in the, uh, in the 70s. Hell of a nice guy, great personality, wonderful human being. Not the same person that's in the White House today. The person that's in uh, the White House today is tugged hard to the left uh, and is a ferocious advocate of war, as are many Republicans uh, and, and Democrats, both parties. Well, I claim there's one party in government, the big government party, both wings of the big government party, Democrat and Republican love war. They think it keeps them in power. It certainly enriches their benefactors in the military industrial banking complex. Yeah. Forgive me, yeah. President Eisenhower, I'm adding another word to your phrase. I'm looking <laughs> up to heaven or wherever Ike is. <laughs> Oh, uh, th this has been uh, really helpful. Now, I can't remember, I think it was Senator Bernie Sanders over the weekend said that he was actually shocked that Biden behaves so much more like a progressive than a moderate. That, that really shocked him. And I'm sure, like you, he's known him for decades. Well, he's behaved like a uh, progressive on domestic policy. He's behaved like L Lindsey Graham would if he were in the White House or John McCain. Um, on foreign policy. I mean, the attack on Nord Stream was a criminal act. It was an act of war against an ally and it violated a treaty, the, the uh, NATO treaty. Yeah. Um, you know, American presidents from the dawn of the CIA, which in my view shouldn't exist, back to Harry Truman now, American presidents have all used the CIA as a private army, but none, as far as I know, has used it on an ally until Joe Biden. Um, why haven't we heard a peep out of Germany on this? Where is the mainstream press? Where is Bernie Sanders? Where's Rand Paul? Where are the anti-war people in the Congress? Not a peep. Yeah. They either think that Cy Hirsch made the story up. He doesn't make things up. He's 88 years old. And this is the crown jewel uh, of his investigative uh, reporting. Or they're embarrassed that Cy bigfooted the billion dollars uh, uh, big media in the German government and came out with a truth that embarrassed them. Yeah, I, I, I think that's what's happened is if they admit to it, then they've triggered a war with Putin. And if they admit to it, then they betrayed Germany, a NATO partner, one of the big, you know, one of the big seven. Um, and so I, I think they will do their best to go to their grave with this story because it's so damaging. But the evidence 
as I read through um, Sai's report, the, I just don't see what other story could be that probable. Um, and Occam's razor tells me, you know, this is probably the simplest explanation. It is, yes. One, one last question and then I'll let you go. I know how busy you are. I really appreciate you uh, taking time away um, from, from your podcast and your day. But, uh, you know, you and I speak with Colonel McGregor. We speak, uh, I'm hoping to get Scott Ritter on my show here in the next two weeks. Um, you, I, they are painting a very different picture of this Ukraine war. I have been uh, harassed online for telling the truth um, about this being a NATO versus Russia war. Does Ukraine have any chance of winning this war? And who do you think ultimately wants to keep this battle going? I, I don't think that it's Zelensky. Well, the first question, uh, uh, the answer is according to Colonel McGregor and, and Scott Ritter, whose sources are on the ground, no, they don't have a chance. Uh, the Russian strength will overwhelm them. I mean, Russia's about to introduce between 300,000 and 500,000 uh, new troops to the theater of war. They will simply overwhelm uh, Ukraine and its American uh, advisors. Who wants to keep the war going? NATO does, Poland, particularly uh, Poland. But the, the NATO mentality is that Putin is the enemy and he must be driven from office, so he must be bled dry to the point where he's no longer popular. But they don't read uh, what's going on in Russia. Putin's popularity is up into the 80s, 80 percent. Look, he may be a butcher. I don't know. Uh, uh, he probably is a butcher. But this is not a, a battle in which we have it's not a fight in which we have a dog. Uh, what do we care about the outcome? This part of the world has been in dispute between Ukraine and Russia since before the United States was a country. If we're going to go around the world looking for monsters to slay, there will be no end to our search. And when we do that, we don't export democracy we, or, or freedom. We export violence. Well, we well, should have learned that from the two world wars, but we didn't. Yeah, well, well said. We're, we're not exporting democracy. We're exporting violence. Thank you so much uh, for coming on. If people want to hear you on a more regular basis, what is the best way to do that? The best way to find me is uh, Judging Freedom on YouTube. You can go to my website, Judge Knapp, where you'll see all of my columns. There's 10 years worth of columns there and a lot of other interesting things, as well as, um, as, well as Judging Freedom. Uh, my producer posts teases of it on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. Uh, but the full episodes uh, are uh, on YouTube uh, and we produce these every day. Great. Thank you so much, Judge, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. I look forward to your next show. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. It's a pleasure. We'll do it again at your convenience. Thank you.